Hello and welcome back to Board Chitless, all you chitheads out there and any first time listeners that have just joined in to join us this week. I'm Lecky and this week I'm joined by Sam and Tristan. And we're also joined by a very special guest, Morton Peterson. This week we've been playing Joking Hazard and Archipelago. Joking Hazard is basically the game you play when you're bored of playing Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> it's, it's a party game and I bought it specifically to play with non-gamers on a drinking night. It's disgusting it's gr- grotesque and it's crude and it's full of jokes about incest and homophobia and all sorts but it's a card game you create in small comic strips it's a game for three to ten people it's 18 plus and it does kind of recommend that you're drunk when you play it it's not much going on with it really <laughs> it's it's quite funny the jokes but it's it's not a gamer's game i don't think at all it's very skin deep isn't it really well it's from the creators of cyanide and happiness so you kind of Anyone that's what read those comics before, there's not much else going on really. It's just a, a superficial giggle more than anything else. I'd happily play it on a drunken night out instead of playing Cards Against Humanity because I've got tired of that. Yeah, Cards Against Humanity does <laughs> outstates welcome after a couple of get plays, isn't it? Yeah, and, th- and this is just a new refresher version. It plays very similarly. There's not nothing complicated about it at all. Yeah, I suppose the main difference between the two is that um, Joking Hazard is illustrated. So instead of just having like general stock phrases with blanks in, you're given a panel, one panel of a three panel comic strip, and you're just filling in the blanks that way and creating your own jokes. There's a little bit more variety with creating a three comic strip as opposed to just a one question, one answer. So the variability is slightly higher. I suppose it'll make a good icebreaker. You know, you're trying to gauge the sense of humor of your friends and how far you can push them. How how sick and twisted they are. Yeah, exactly. There is about a thousand cards in there, I think. There's a lot in there, but and it's down to the combinations. But yeah, there's not... You are, you are relying on the homosexual jokes, uh, the incest jokes, and a couple of vomiting and murderous jokes. I'm not interested in bringing this back to the table, really. <laughs> Especially enough. with some gamers. <laughs> we yeah. um, we did only play it for about 20, 25 minutes. And like considering the amount of content that you do get in the box, we probably only really touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of the content. Tristan, how did you find it? Is it literally pick it up and put it back down again for you? Or I can't honestly think of anything to add that you haven't already said. <laughs> it's, it's barely a game. It's literally a reskin of Cards Against Humanity, uh, which, you know, you play that through two times and that's it. It's done. You're done with it. Um, and I see the same thing happening with this. But that said, for the couple of rounds we played it, I did it did squeeze a giggle out of me from peering into your sick minds. Um, <laughs> and I think, like Sam says, it's it's a good game for knocking about with non-gamers and having a few drinks and getting sick jokes out there. But it's just not welcome at game night. <laughs> it is not a thematic game or an interesting game by any stretch. So, um, yeah, yeah. If, we've, if we've got half an hour to burn, I'd probably pick up Resistance Avalon, and if you've got less than half an hour to burn, it's a love letter, isn't it, really? <laughs> Literally anything else. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll take it off the gaming shelf and put it back in the liquor cupboard then. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect place for it. <laughs> On this week's board chitless, we have Morton Peterson, who has been a board gamer for 30 years and designing awful games, that's his words, by the way, uh, for almost as long. Five years ago, Morton started getting serious about game design, mainly for solo games. So Morton and his team made the official solo modes for Scythe, Terra Mystica Gaia Project, Viticulture, Between Two Cities, and the upcoming Charterstone and Euphoria. Uh, Morton writes a blog about solo gaming on Board Game Geek, and a blog about his work for Stonemaier Games, because a couple of years ago, Morton was hired by Stonemaier Games. Morton, let's start off with your background and your gaming interests. What led you into board game design in the first place? Yeah, well, as you said, I've been designing board games forever, and they've all been awful. <laughs> um, Is that true? Are you just being humble? Oh, I've, I've done a bazillion awful games uh, <laughs> in my lifetime. But then about five years ago, I started getting serious about it. And since then, I think I've... I think that's a massive understatement because I've played maybe 10 or 15 games against the Scythe Automa now 
And uh, I think it's an excellent, excellent design that you've put together there. And I curse you for the level of difficulty <laughs> involved in some of those automas because I uh, I spent a few games getting to grips with the, the baby easy automatina. I, I, I can't pronounce it. Which one? Automata is the is the baby one, right? So um took me about three or four goes to even beat that. And I was like, right, I'm ready now. I'm going to move on to regular normal mode. And I've been struggling ever since. So, uh, <laughs> so, levels, yeah, for you to explore. <laughs> there's, pl- there's plenty of game left there for me. Um, but yeah, so so what moved what moved you to this situation? I mean, what brought you uh, to, as you say, getting serious about game design? It was a ser- series of things. First of all, I had had a break in board gaming where I moved to another city and I got a son, which didn't leave all that much time for for board gaming. It was hard to find time to get the guys together. Basically, everybody got kids at the same time. So uh, I tried out board gaming, uh, solo board gaming. On the subject of solo board gaming specifically, I mean, your, yours is a pretty cool, specific, um, kind of specialist role in board game design in building what you call automas, which is specifically solo rules, right? For the uninitiated, could you tell us about the automa factory and, and what it is you do to sort of create those solo rules? Yeah, uh, Automa Factory, that's my own one-man company that I started once I started working for Stormire Games. What I do in Stormire Games is I've built up a team of people who helps me. And so for all projects, we've been between two and five people working on. So I've never done an solo mode myself. I've always had help. And I think that's very important. What we then do is that we take a multiplayer game that's nearing the final stages of design development. Then we try to figure out what are the core interactions between players in that game. Because there's no way we can mimic a full human player with a set of cardboard. You also have the problem. The human player needs to handle everything for that awesome. And it's boring to handle another player that's not yourself. Just follow some steps that you have to carry out. So it needs to be very simple. This also means we have to simplify the way it plays the game. And so that's why we identify the core interactions with other players, and then we just mimic those interactions. And we don't try to mimic them by having our awesome actually play the game. We instead, instead try to mimic them by cheating. In uh, Culture, for example, which is a game about running a vineyard, then the awesome does not run a vineyard. It just places its workers at random. It's a worker placement game, so the core interaction is blocking each other. It's not really all that important what the automa would be building on its vineyard. So we just remove that and then try to to mimic the core point of interaction in the game and then remove everything else. So you can see the automas we build like a kind of shell where the surface of that shell is the interaction points and behind it there's nothing because everything that's behind it is not important to the play experience for the human player. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things I noticed about the Scythe Automa. You don't have to keep track of everything. It doesn't It doesn't act the same way a player would. It just gets to the places that it needs to go to to represent another player, and it does that really well. Uh, and that you, you don't have to be constantly moving every piece and, and creating all of its uh, resources and things like that. It just does the things that are going to bother basically, other players and going to interact yeah. with other players. Yeah, yes. More of a disruptive influence than anything that's trying to actually outright win the game. Exactly, but it also, but the way the way you and your guys have put them together, Morton, is um, is quite brilliant because it's it's never just a sort of beat your score type situation. It always gives you the feeling of um, someone interfering with your plans, like you, you're up against someone. You, we're up against you, right? What sort of games are you drawn to, Morton? Well, if it's in relation to building awesomeness, then I don't make the choice myself. Because basically we just do awesomeness for everything that Stormire Games puts out. We've had some offers from other companies, but basically we haven't had the time for that. Game Stack Maya keep, keeps us busy. <laughs> we've had uh, one awesomeer we've just finished for the follow-up to Terra Mystica, the Gaia project. When Fe- Feuerland Spiele, the publisher of Terra Mystica, approached us asking whether we wanted to do a, a solo system for the follow-up to Terra Mystica, we, well, we were just so geeked out with them, we couldn't say no. <laughs> uh, games are presented to you. Are there any sort of game designers that you would love to get in touch with you and say, I've got X game and I'd love you to create a solo version for it? Will 
Rosenberg would be a, a prime candidate, but he does his own solo modes. But I would like to do uh, Awesomeness for some of his games. So yeah, I think he would be the prime candidate after I have already been allowed to work on Terra Mystica. What is it that makes you say him in particular? Because he make a ton of great games and because his games would work well with the way I work with the system. We have built up with uh, these awesome crew have some design principles with these core interactions I talked about, focusing on them, streamlining, simple mechanics, stuff like that. And I think they would work well with a lot of his games and several of them are worker placement, which is one of the best kinds of games or uh, the way we work. Basically, it needs to be a Euro game. <laughs> I see. What, okay. we, what we do wouldn't work for a Merry Trash because we focus on simple me- mechanics and streamlined mechanics which I don't think would go away well with a large board game or block bowl or yeah. something like that. We started with the easy one, which is culture. That was fairly easy, good place to start. And then the next one was a game of negotiation and social social interaction between two cities. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that was a, an interesting challenge to make a solo mode for. We, we cheated a bit. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know whether you've tried the game. What is happening is that you have the players from three to seven players sitting in a circle, and between each player is a city, and you're building that in cooperation with the two of you. So you're building a city with the person on the right and a city yes. with the person on the left. Yes, I have played that once. It was at a works gaming night, and it's an excellent game. <laughs> um, a lot of parks going down for no apparent reason other than it made everything look prettier. Um, I can see exactly why, why he had some trouble with that. You mentioned worker placement features quite heavily in the type of game that you do solo modes for. Uh, what are your favourite games and why? Top three, for example. That's tough. Are we talking solo games or any game? Any game. I think my favorite game is also a solo game. That's Dawn of the Set by a designer called Herman Lutman. That's just awesome. That's like playing a zombie movie. I think you'll love it, Tristan. Um, <laughs> it sounds very thematic. The theme just works. You really feel like you are playing a, a zombie movie. Then I really like Puerto Rico. It's been a while since I played it, but I love that game. And uh, it's yes, Tigris and Euphrates. Well, am I pronouncing it correctly? I wouldn't know how to pronounce it. I would have said Tigris and Euphrates, but I, that's probably wrong as well. <laughs> Tigris or Euphrat, I would call it. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, you... <laughs> I'm sitting here with uh, a metal token, right, from Charleston. Can you tell us anything about Charleston? What are you, have you signed a complete uh, non-disclosure agreement, or are you allowed to drop tidbits for us? Yeah, well, it's a worker placement game again, but this time our job for the solo mode was quite a bit hard because... The board is getting built as you play the game. It's a legacy game, so you're building this village into a town over the course of 12 games. So you don't, we don't know ahead of time what the board will look like and it'll change from one game to the next. And in one gaming group, it'll look one way and another group will end up in a completely different way. So that has been a bit of a challenge figuring out how to place the workers there and make the interaction around that. And we unlock cards with new rules, stuff like that. So the rule will also be changing as the campaign goes on. And uh, at the same time, this awesome has to be playable by people who don't normally play solo games. Because we designed the awesome so that if you're in a uh, playgroup of four uh, people who play this campaign, and uh, today Tristan can't make it, then you can put in the awesome to play Tristan. Uh, and you won't notice the difference. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the It'd be like the conversation if I'm not there. Oh, <laughs> you won't notice, definitely. <laughs> it would take your place uh, in the game, and so it would need to be quick, fairly quick to learn by people who are not used to running a bot in a board game. I see. So it needs to be simple, but at the same time, it needs to handle all these things changing and special rules coming yeah. up and leaving again. With it being a legacy game, I mean, presumably you have to play maybe, what is it, 12 sessions of Charterstone to to finish it sort of thing? So Yeah, and then you need to play it afterwards also, because after the 12 campaign games, you can just continue playing the game with just a few rule tricks. Right. And we also need to make sure that the awesome works for that. So that's basically... 12 times the amount of playtesting of a regular game because, because you're going to play it in all the different levels. Because we have to play afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see the sort of the future of board gaming then involving Gautama? So if I buy a two to six player game, 
I could expect to be able to play that with just me and my girlfriend, but then three or four or time we're in there just to make it more interesting. Yeah, that's definitely something we have talked about and we've actually done it also for Between Two Cities, which requires three players. Mm -hmm. Then we have two autonomous in that game to play free games. But we can also take one or more bots and add to a two-player game. You can add one bot to play a three-player game if you're only two, or mm -hmm. if you're four players, you could play a six-player game with the, the two autonomous. For Scythe, we did some extra rules after we have made the game we made some extra rules and put them on board game deep which allows you to play with any combination of uh, humans and automas so you could play uh, two players against two automas for example if you want that or a four player game with where two of them was yeah. were automas and everybody is against everybody and we've had players playing with seven automas against themselves cool. um, yeah I mean, that's something we, we talked about doing next time we play actually if it's a three-player game i'd like to have one automa per player because i think it just ratchets up the tension a lot more because the automas are aggressive as hell and you can't do anything about that you i mean you in a in a multiplayer game yeah. you can sort of turtle or you know the tactics are dependent on your group your group might be aggressive yeah um, but however you play the automas are just going to stride ahead without you anyway and just do their own yeah. thing and fight over the factory whilst you're just yeah. piddling about resources so I think it'll be really interesting to try that and uh, next time we play Scythe I want to chuck in a load of automas and see how we get on definitely definitely how do you stop the rule set for automas from snowballing from becoming these great beasts where if the, you turn this card over then you have to move this token and you have to move this player over how do you keep it to the, the bare essentials of call to action so that the play can continue quite swiftly uh, I say no when someone suggests something <laughs> just keep saying no just pair it down <laughs> to nothing <laughs> exactly I think you learn as you do it multiple times you, you get a feel for what you can cut and basically I like to just cut as cut and cut and cut and then at one point you notice this no longer feels like Amazing. the real game that I'm no longer staying true to the spirit of the yeah. multiplayer game so when that happens you need to go one step back and then you're there Pair, right. pair it down until it's broken and then put it back in. <laughs> Fix it back together. Yeah, and then you know you've got to overpack weight. Yeah. Brilliant. Because cool. it really means we shoot each other's ideas down all the time. Yeah, yeah. And because we only add something if we really, really, really need it. And all the time we get these, oh, it would be cool if we did this and it would be more realistic if we did that and... No. Good. It sounds like you're very principled in that respect, Martin. I appreciate that. I did think of one question before we go. We've been discussing quite a lot recently about Kickstarter as a platform for developing new games. And of course, um, Scythe was a huge hit on Kickstarter. Uh, what are your feelings on the platform in general for developing new games? And uh, what are your thoughts on Kickstarter as a whole? I think it's an awesome addition to the hobby. It sort of gives uh, Indies a way around publishers. Um, so you have a chance of getting published if you have something that doesn't fit within the normal retail scheme and what norm, what publishers would normally do because they have to be conservative because you, you can't sell a game costing more than $100 in a board game store. Yeah. You, you can't sell a game that takes up an enormous amount of shelf space in the, in the store because you, you don't make enough on that one game to make up for the amount of shelf space you use. So there's... A strict limit to how big you can make your game something like kingdom death monster that would never have seen the light of day definitely no if not for for kickstarter gloomhaven i, I don't think that would ever have seen the light of day or without kickstarter and, and i also like how it ties the designers together with the community yes you, you get a much more of a bond there it becomes much more personal and mm -hmm. you build a community around your game. I love Kickstarter also as a supporter and not only as someone who works for a publisher. Yeah. I think I've supported something like a hundred board games on Kickstarter. Wow. And I, I love the feel of that community that can build around a Kickstarter. Yeah. And I like being able to help someone make their dream come true. I think you could probably relate to that, Tristan. Yeah, right. definitely. No, it's a, it's a hugely unique experience, I would say, on, on both sides, you know, as, as being a cheerleader, watching other projects, and like you so eloquently put it, watching other people's dreams come to life, you know, and playing a small role in that. And, um, and the flip side of that, being able to gather feedback from thousands of people during the either the development or the ongoing production of your game, which is just, it's access to... 
you know, a thousand experts straight away that you yeah. wouldn't have had in development. And it's brilliant. You know, obviously there is an element of uh, tuning out some of the noise during that and, and doing what you said before. Nope, <laughs> nope, yeah. nope. Say no to people. But, um, but yeah, no, I think it's a hugely exciting and perhaps it's a loaded question us asking that, to be honest, it's just something that we've been talking a lot about in the board checklist group and stuff. But um, yeah, no, it's really interesting to get your insights, especially as someone who, as you say, works for a company that uh, benefits from Kickstarter, but also very much as, Someone who's obviously, I'm looking at your game collection there, um, you know, someone who's obviously used Kickstarter and come across products like Gloomhaven, which, as you say, wouldn't have existed outside of that uh, platform. But there's definitely also downside where there's a ton of work doing a, a Kickstarter again, interest, and I think you can relate to that. And I think Jamie Stegmeier spent something like three months handling site after the Kickstarter ended, and he had probably spent a month or more preparing it mm -hmm. so that's maybe four five six months where he didn't work on game design it was just the project and the handling of the logistics yeah. and everything yeah yeah but but he's a perfectionist right when he does a kickstarter he tends to do it right so of course you could get away with less work and if you don't have twenty thousand backers it's also less work because we have a had a ton of communication of that project because there were so many backers and there were we were a few people handling uh, the comments. So when Jamie went to bed, I would sit there to, uh, <laughs> to reply. And when I went to bed, he would be there. Because Tag teaming. Oh, this, yeah. is a, this is a dangerous idea. I'm, I think I'm on holiday when 1066 <laughs> goes on Kickstarter. You're going nowhere. <laughs> and then we have a, a guy, one of my partners, David Studley, who's in uh, Washington, DC. So he could also field questions on the Kickstarter. Yeah. But what I agree. Thing, and we have a guy in Germany, uh, Linus Hütter, who's also helping us and who could also respond to comments on the Kickstarter. And again, something that would have only happened on Kickstarter really is that international community, you know, with you guys all over the world coming together on the same project, you know, united by Kickstarter. Scythe, to me, is a great example of a game produced to such a high standard that you just wouldn't have got 10 years ago, you know, with the player boards, with the impressions where you can yeah. fit the cubes in and everything and upgrades that you could get, you know, the more realistic components and everything and down to the plastic miniatures and the intricately designed wooden meeples and stuff. It's the ultimate sort of Kickstarter dream that, you know, and everything coming together so well. But that's Jamie. He's a pro, right? <laughs> What's it like working with Jamie Stegman? I said I wouldn't ask any more questions. What's it like working with uh, Jamie and uh, Stonemaier Games? Well, it's actually good. A lot of the time I do my own thing because he does the multiplayer game and I do the, my team and I do the solo mode. So he gets us input, but he also knows that we know solo stuff and he doesn't. And I know that on multiplayer, he's a way better designer than I am. So we can, we bounce ideas off each other. We have a monthly Skype call where, where we discuss what's going on and uh, give each other feedback and ideas bounce ideas of each other and he has helped me a lot on the euphoria expansion again because he's a better multiplayer designer so he's he has helped sometimes put it in a new direction when i had gotten lost and of course she knows euphoria better than me well perhaps that's changed like i can't count the number of times i've played <laughs> euphoria <laughs> first we start developing an ultima for the base game and we did that tried it in two steps First worked on it, and then another project came along, then worked on it again, and another project came along. Then we started on the expansion, and then that was, was on hold, and then we worked on the expansion. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, it's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you and getting your insights on the whole solo automa design and everything, and maybe sometime we can get you back on the show at a later date and you can talk to us again about Charterstone and Euphoria when you know they've been released to the world. But I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and spending some time with us tonight. And uh, I'm sure I speak for Lecky as well and I say we just appreciate you yeah, it's been sharing your insights. Thanks. You owe me an interview, Tristan, because I've interviewed you twice. You owe me <laughs> you once. Okay. We'll make sure it balances out. Yeah. Okay. But it's right talking to you guys, and thank you for having me. The second game that we played tonight was Archipelago. It's probably one of the table's favourite games. We've played it a few times before, but it's the first time we've actually talked about it. Tristan, this is this is one of your babies. Um, what's the game all about? Archipelago. You are colonists colonising an archipelago, and the theme 
uh, I think this has been touched on by every single other review out there, but it's a little bit controversial because it involves sort of taking advantage of local people on an island and using the indigenous population to your advantage. But um, if we can just skirt past that <laughs> and whatever our political opinions on that whole situation might be and enjoy it for the game that it is, this, I think, is one of my favourite games. It's by Christoph Bollinger. It's for two to five people. Plays in uh, 30 to 240 minutes. I'm going to say 240 plus minutes with our group. Uh, that's on the, the medium level. So you can play it as like a short game, medium or hard game. Long game, sorry. The short game, I think you could, you could probably maybe play in a couple of hours. But even the medium game, we went on for maybe four hours tonight. It's it's a biggie. But at no point do I feel when I'm playing this that I'm unengaged in what's happening. It's excruciating watching other people's turns and seeing them nick your resources or screw you over. It says it's semi-cooperative. I'd, I barely see the cooperation. <laughs> that's our group, right? There's no cooperation in it. Um, even if you're not the separatist, you're still likely to tank the colony just out of spite. The things that are going for it in its favour for me, first of all, the art is incredible. The tiles are amazing. The art on the cover, I mean, this is one of the games that I would just buy because of the cover art. That's how shallow I am. The theme of exploration and, you know, un- discovering all these resources that are hidden on the island and accumulating stone and iron and cows and pineapples which was a big thing tonight pineapples was the resource of the day that we needed to get extra victory points so managing your colony stopping the locals from rebelling against you uh, accumulating resources building out your civilization with wonders and technological evolutions and characters that are going to help push you along like stonemasons and things like that it's got all the ingredients of things that I love about developing and growing like a, a burgeoning, almost civilization type game, but within this very specific theme of exploring islands. And there's very little I don't like about this game. Even when I'm losing and hating it, I'm having a really good time with it at the same time. It's, yeah, um, I'm gushing now. So I'm going to pass over to one of you before I give any more thoughts on it. What do you think, Sam? I love it. I think this, I think from the past podcast that we've done so far, it's quite clear that this is my cup of tea. And I keep going, referring to these X's. This is similar. It's not for X. It's not no, no, no. no. This is definitely not for X. Don't listen to Sam, anybody. It's a worker placement. I'm not Euro. saying it's a 4X. It's, it's definitely a not a 4X. But it scratches the same itches that the 4X's do for me. There's no extermination in this. Uh, you're not fighting there's it out. The, there's no fighting. That's what I just said. Well, you said there's no extermination. You implied there was fighting. You're not fighting it it's out. a Euro. <laughs> I did get your guy out of that town. I did yeah. use a Trojan horse. You, you did, yes. We have got the. It was a bureaucratic maneuver. <laughs> but for me, it it fills that that sort of void there, and I really sort of enjoy that. You, it's the exploration. You got the tile flipping, flipping you, tiles. Yeah, you're never quite sure where the the place you're exploring is going to fit correctly. You, whether you can actually move into it, whether you can use those resources. Uh, so it adds some random elements with that. There's not so much tech in this. You do get bits of it coming through, with, but it's more recruits. So it feels like you're recruiting people off the ships. So you're getting your stonemasons or your your headhunters or whatever it is, uh, but you're not really advancing your technology as much. There's just little bits and pieces, but I don't think that detracts from it at all it's just something a little bit different yeah it's like a um, second tier sort of actions isn't it really where you is that what they refer to as characters and plots or characters and uh, progress evolution so you, you, technologies so at the end of each sure it's just tech <laughs> they yeah. are techs yeah, okay well, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel like techs uh it's mainly people related isn't it, it apart like from it. the occasional building but Tristan's diving into the box now to uh, to see exactly what's going on. The rule book is coming out. Um, but yeah, at the end of each round, you... Evolution cards. So Excellent. You're evolving, not technology. So it's evolution cards, yeah. So My point might be a bit null and void, but it it just it feels different to a Forex. And I know it's not a Forex, we've said that, but it, it feels different, but it feels like it's filling that same sort of area of gaming for me. It feels like I'm getting that same sort of 
nourishment from the game of the same sort yeah. of fulfillment that I get from those Forex games. But I do just really enjoy it and I'm quite terrible at it most of the time. There's um there's a certain amount of uh take not it's not like a you know take that mechanic like you know you throw a card down and it completely screws over one of the other players but a lot of the bartering and back and forth between the players so I might be after stone so Sam's gonna buy it out from under me and then offer it to sell it back to me at it grossly exaggerated prices <laughs> just because he can um tends to go on quite a bit and at the end of each round you get to bid for who's going to be the first player and um, which means there's a load of boons that come with that and um, so going back to these evolution cards and these like technology cards if you're the first player you can use another person's evolution card usually paying a bit extra than what they would pay to use it then take it off the board for them. There's a lot of stuff like that going on, which I suppose would happen in a Forex game where you move into someone's tile, completely decimate the population and then move on. Even though it's a semi-cooperative game, it does bring out the worst in us sometimes. <laughs> I, think, I think it's just that depth, isn't it? You know, the, the, It feels like there's a lot going on underneath. No matter what actions you're taking, it feels like there's a lot happening at any one time. And I think that's that's what it is. It's, it's like the scythe and eclipse and things like that that it feels like there's a lot moving i'd go as far to say that there's a lot going on on the surface i think it's one of the most complicated games that i've played um purely because there's an there's a domestic market there's an export market all of which the costs of goods being sold or bought are changing depending on how much you've already put in there you've got the general map itself then you've got to manage the evolution and then you have to manage your secret objective. The rebels, the population. Exactly. And on the other side of that, you've got to try and work out what other people's secret objectives are because by completing your own, you don't want to hand them cheap victory points by ending the game early. So there's an awful, there is an awful lot going on and my brain's starting to melt just thinking about <laughs> it. It's so, processing. Yeah, it took, it's probably the fourth game of it I've played and it's probably the first game that I felt comfortable playing where I actually had a really good idea of what was going on we don't play it that often which might have something to do with it but it is quite it's quite an intense game it's not for the faint-hearted really i think that's exactly why it's up my street and it's exactly the sort of game that our, our group is uh, fit for because of the theme the depth of gameplay the options you always feel like oh my god i just want to do one more thing and and you never can and um the things that other people are doing to screw you over as you mentioned during the, the gameplay but it all feels really cool and really well implemented. There are a lot of rules, a lot of rules, exceptions, certain towns and markets and ports and churches, all the things that you can build all do different things and they're all managed differently and you have to have a guy in each of them to be able to work them unless you've got a town and the town will govern the churches and the ports and you can do things during your action. You can do uh, use evolution cards during your action. You can use markets and ports during your action. So there's tons of like opportunities and things that you can do to try and maximise your go. They're all leading towards the objective. And as you say, you've got to keep an eye on what everybody else is doing. So if you guys start buying ports and my objective isn't ports, I have to buy one just to make sure that you're not getting one over on me and leaving me behind. Because if you have to register on all the victory point options, because if you don't have, if one of them is ports and you don't have any ports at all, you don't score any points. So that's... An, for example, our three-player game, that's the difference between two or three victory points and none at all, which is like, you're out of the game, you know. So you really do have to watch what everybody else is doing and see what resources they're going for. Oh, they're going for stone. They're going to build stuff. I need to get stone in. And that's brilliant. I also think at the start of the game, for example, I was, <laughs> I was landlocked on this tiny piece of land and you guys were exploring and you sort of met up with the tiles. So that led to huge exploration options where I was completely locked in for a, a lot of time, it felt like. Um, but then my focus was so much on exploring. By the time that shifted and you guys were building your little stone and iron empires, I was exploring again and suddenly start to find all these grasslands behind where I was. And it, pa pineapple farms. And pineapple farms. <laughs> so many pineapple so farms. So many pineapples. <laughs> Um, but the dynamic is constantly shifting and um, your focus on exploring or growing your population, collecting pineapples or whatever it is, is always interesting and different. And the we have got the War and Peace expansion shuffled in, so we should probably point that out. So that ah, right, so we, that's, yeah, a, that's where all fight. the player interaction stuff comes in because the base game itself, is I still think it's brilliant, yeah. but the expansion adds all the extra stuff. So 
my putting a Trojan horse in the middle of Sam's town and kicking his mare out so I could take it over. That's from the expansion. And all the other bits where you can steal and assassinate each other and lay siege to each other, those are all expansion content. And I think it's one of those where you have to get the expansion and put it in um, to really sort of exaggerate the options that you can get with the evolution cards. Especially if your gaming group like ours loves to stab each other in the back. Oh yeah, I mean it's semi-cooperative, <laughs> you know, so you have to stab each other in the back. It's the rules. Well, to me, that this is semi-cooperative, and Dead of Winter is semi-cooperative. But to me, Dead of Winter is a lot more cooperative than this is ever going to be. I think Dead of Winter kind of forces you to be cooperative. Well, Dead of Winter, you you, you have to win together. In this, there's only one winner, so it's a huge difference. This is, yeah, I would yeah. say that's barely semi-cooperative, whereas in Dead of Winter, unless you are the traitor, you are still working towards keeping the colony alive. Whereas in this, you, well, yeah, you are sp- supposed to try and stop it from flipping the colony, like from the rebels from taking over. That's sort of where I was going from. I mean, I was I was the traitor, and I had to keep it from flipping anyway to not like give my hand away straight away. And what was your experience of being El Traitor? I was really bad at it. <laughs> Just really, bad. I uh, I still enjoyed it, and I was trying to find a tactic to get within sort of striking distance to fulfill my goal, yeah. uh, which I had to try and get the number of rebels ahead of the over, overall population. But we were constantly just keeping it and Lecky with his bishop constantly just <laughs> pushing it back. Abusing, so I was, I was always, it was always just out of <laughs> grasp. I was always within like one or two. Yeah. And I would have been able to do it. Uh, one so, or two rebels, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I could have just tanked the whole thing, but I couldn't give my hand away by pushing that through. You know, two turns I would have achieved it, but as soon as I gave that hand away, yeah, it it would have been counteracted, and then I'd have been screwed for the rest of the game. Do you feel the pain there? Because it must be so difficult with only three players to try and push the colony into a complete collapse when the other two players are all they're going to be doing is just keeping. Uh, you know, eagle eye on all of the markets and where the native population and how happy they are. Were we though lucky? Because I don't remember either of us being particularly responsible in that we... respect with the amount of breeding and. <laughs> Full disclosure: we were really only doing it so we could take the mick out of Sam, <laughs> <laughs> but we did it nonetheless. Um, at one point, I think I was just using the bishop because I had about forty-five gold behind my screen. And I could use it to um, try and emotionally blackmail you into doing stuff for me. It didn't work, but it was a lot of fun. Well, that's it. I think um, there's not there's not much lag in this game. It's a, quite a slow burning game just because of the sheer amount of options that you've got. Um, but the uh, analysis paralysis does start to kick in sort of mid game, and I found myself playing two sort of sub games just to amuse myself really. Where I was trying to find how cheaply I could buy pineapples for other people. The answer is not very cheaply. And the other little game that I was playing was how much money can I generate in one turn? And it turned out it was twenty. So that worked <laughs> out really well. That paid for my pineapples, which I quickly <laughs> lost. Um, so it just. If you if you do let the game get away from you, if it's, if you're the sort of player where if you're feeling that you're starting to slip behind, you'll kind of lose interest in the game. This probably isn't one for you because you'll find yourself another ninety minutes in a position where you're not really going to be having much fun. Whereas if you really like to analyze and think about two, three steps in advance and how you can really leverage your friends to get what, exactly what you need from them, then this is probably the game for you. I think I think the one good thing with saying that is that there is no single route to take to win so you fall yeah. behind and it's not like oh well if they've all got the pineapples that's it i'm at the game there is about 30 different ways you can start focusing on or aiming towards to actually to win the game so to me that never feels like it's getting out of hand like we were fighting over pineapples the whole game because that was the the open win condition yeah but then when you started building churches as well i was like you had no pineapple, so you went for the churches, which then yes. ended again. So we had to then try and pick up on that to make sure you didn't get ahead of it. Yeah, it's easy to assume there was a solid strategy there, but um, but, but that's what I mean. Yeah, there, there's a lot of bluffing in that respect, and there's yeah. no straight win condition. You know, yeah, no, you're, you're right. Yeah, not um, only the win conditions, but the end game condition. I think that's really yeah, yeah. a really cool aspect to it as well. Is that everybody has one way to score extra points that they know about and one way that the game is going to end that they know about. So each of us is sitting on 
a game end condition and you either delay that or hurry it depending on your situation on the board. So if you think you're ahead and you're doing okay, you want to move towards that happening. But as soon as you start moving towards that happening and if other people start copying you, it might spiral and go quicker than you expected. So Lecky's end game condition was five churches on the board. As soon as he built a couple, we suddenly redoubled our church building efforts and that was it. The game suddenly came to a crashing end. Yeah. I really enjoy that aspect of it because it's so not like... Um, in Eclipse, there's always the grand melee and round nine. I love Eclipse, but there's always that one last turn where everybody goes mental in the middle and just blast the crap out of each other. Whereas in this, you can never quite be sure. So you might have your end game move planned, but it might never come about because somebody else, you know, springs it on you. Oh, you just did this. You yeah. emptied you emptied the bank. That's it. We're done. Or a crisis undermines all the work that you've done. Yeah. And then, you, yeah, you've gathered the most pineapples and then all of a sudden they have to throw them all the way to the local. The great, the great pineapple wars. I just imagine two ships of you guys just throwing pineapples from one People are going to get the impression this game is a lot about pineapples. They're not, they're it's enough. exotic fruit, to be fair. <laughs> Final summary thoughts on the game. Lecky. I think we've been all over it, really. Um, it's a fantastic game. It's very involved. It's ta- it took an awful long time for a medium sort of sized game to play. It's probably no worse than Eclipse for that. I probably enjoy Eclipse more because I just understand the game better. It's unfair to compare the two. It's like chalk and cheese, I know. But with Archipelago, I feel like you really do have to have your wits about you. Um, I was lucky enough to win the game this week, but I think that was just... Skilled. Skilled enough. Skilled enough. <laughs> I think there was a lot of luck to it, and that's probably what get, makes the game really good. It's so unpredictable. It's ridiculous, and you're never going to know what your mates are up to, but you, you're going to have so much fun in trying to work it out, really. But you'd prefer it if it had plasma missiles. Probably, yes, <laughs> definitely. So you say you say it's unpredictable, but I don't think it's really luck based as much. I think there is more a bit more planning around it. It's not you're not relying on the rolls of dice and things. No, but next time that you're drawing tiles and getting nothing but mountains, and I'm going to remind you that there's not that much luck. I to the game. Yeah. <laughs> we were all in a, a similar place with exploring though, because Tristan got trapped in his tiny little island for. Half the game. I got hemmed in by mountains. You got hemmed in by mountains. We couldn't explore the water areas. So we were all in a similar place. So it doesn't feel as luck-based as... We only d- rolled the dice once to decide who went first. Yeah. And then the rest of it is very much down to how much money you're willing to spend or what actions you're going to do or, you know, if you do... Yeah, so it's, that, it's but... unpredictable. There's a lot of yeah. varied play, a lot of variety to it, but it doesn't feel like it's just down to luck. There's a lot of planning and a lot of things you can negate every action. Plus, there's no miss a turn. I'm just going to say once again, <laughs> when you explore and get nothing but mountains, <laughs> it feels very much like a missing turn. You chose to miss a turn. <laughs> yeah. But it does have that backup where with the evolution cards and with you know the markets and the ports, you do those as a secondary part of your action. So if you were to explore, you can do a, you can use a merchant turn um, in your market and you can then you use an evolution card at the same time. And you do quite a lot in that turn. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to... Tristan was doing some super explores, even with failed explores, weren't you? You're like turning over about 12 tiles in a, in a game. Uh, yeah, I had the scout and the explorer, I think. Yeah. So it really sort of boosted it. And in fact, I needed those to get me back into the game after I was stranded. But yeah, I think it delivers on so many levels for me. And I think one of the things that sort of evens it out for all of us is the split of wins that we've had over the number of plays that we've had. I think we've all won maybe uh, two games each sort of thing. So we've learned it all at the same pace. We've um, got to the same sort of level of ability in the game yeah. at the same pace. And yeah, I just have a really good time whenever we play it. I'd love to see this hit the table more often. I know we're kind of sinking into the mode now of every episode, only loving all the games that we play, like the thematic games. But those, that's, well, except <laughs> joking, <laughs> joking, joking. But yeah, that's the nature of the, just playing the games that we, you know, really enjoy. And this would be probably probably in my top 10. I would give it, you know, a, a super high rating. And just because of, it's so well implemented, it's so lovely to look at, it's tactile, uh, all of the, the mechanics, however complicated they are, make sense, they make thematic sense. And uh, it always keeps you on your toes. And even throughout that three or four hour epic session that we just had, I was engaged throughout and enjoying mm. even you know, getting hosed by you guys. And and then the final score as well. So we and Lucky tied on that final score and 
he clinched it on money, you know, and a and a tiebreaker. But it was just it was brilliant and excruciating getting to that point and yeah, just love it. Nice one. So Archipelago, fantastic game, one to bring for the very much a gamer's game really. If you're if you feel like a veteran of board gaming, definitely buy this one. And if you really like your worker placement, you're really into like economy based I might as well have an Excel spreadsheet in front of me for all the numbers that I can see. Then just pick this one up. You really won't regret it. We'll be back next week with more games. I'm not sure what we're going to play, but we'll work it out between now and then. We've got a whole maybe, week to decide. Maybe some new ones that we've never played before. Remember that we are on iTunes as well as SoundCloud. So if you could like and subscribe, and even if you'd be so kind as to write a little review and tell us exactly where we're going wrong with this hodgepodge <laughs> of a production, we'd really appreciate that. And we're on YouTube too. And we're also on YouTube. Yep. I All over the place. Excellent. We're just, you can't move for board chit list. <laughs> chit heads are literally everywhere on the interwebs. Talking chit chat. <laughs> oh. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, we've, um, we've really, really hit the bottom of the barrel now. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.